We want to welcome you back to the Biblical History Center podcast. I believe this is episode two. Uh, Christy and I are your hosts. I'm Carlos Cantu, Executive Director of the Biblical History Center. And Ms. Christy, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, it's Christy. Christy <laughs> is our Director of Programming and Curation here at the Biblical History Center. Well, we want to thank you all for listening. Uh, we've seen some, uh, we've seen a lot of engagement on our podcast from uh, the first episode. So thank you so much for listening in. And today we just want to chat a little bit about some of the things that have been happening in the archaeological world. Is that correct, Christy? Yeah. So we've got one archaeological update for you guys, and then another just kind of breakdown of why is Christmas on December 25th? Oh, my goodness. Uh, This is this is going to be I wonder if anybody out there that's listening is is thinking to themselves, oh, this is going to be debatable. (laughs) (laughs) They're right. (laughs) <laughs> this is going to be debatable. It is. They're it is. right. Well, I think we should. I think we should actually talk about uh, about a new discovery that uh, took place that involves some royalty. I'm excited uh, about this, uh, and I believe uh, is it Necropolis and Saquara? Is that correct, Christy? That yeah. Uh, so there's found? a there's um, a new mummy cache that has been found in Saqqara, and. Um, you might remember the name Saqqara coming out of Egypt from last year. They found um, a large mummy cache there as well as the most complete copy of the Book of the Dead that has ever been found. But um, they recently unearthed another mummy cache um, and um, over... 300 coffins and 100 mummies. I mean, it's amazing. Um, And it holds things that most archaeologists and historians have never even heard of. It's stuff that it's, it's going to change Egyptian history as we know it. Right. Right. And, and, and Saquara, uh, as far as the background, this, these are the ancient burial grounds of just Egyptian royalty, correct? Uh, yeah, Egyptian right. royalty it's, and right, right. officials. Yeah, right, right. The the capital of where it all happened is that correct as well? Well, the capital changed a few times in Egyptian history, which is not uncommon. I mean, it's changed even right, in American right. history. You know, when we're a really young nation. What do you mean? It's not Branson, Missouri. Yeah. So, um, so this is one of, um, I believe it's near one of the capitals. Obviously, you're not burying you know, dead bodies in your capital. Um, So that's actually what necropolis means. The word necropolis, instead of acropolis, where you would find like a temple or a palace inside the city, a necropolis is um, usually the next hill over outside of town or um, in ancient Egypt, it's away from the green line of the Nile and a little bit deeper into the desert and the mountains. And um, it is where you bury those that have deceased. Right, right. Now, usually, and uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Christy, and and even in your time where you did some excavations yourself, uh, you know, usually there's always like a series of interconnected tunnels uh, that just lead to various places. Now, at this one, did they find, you know, usually because they usually find large numbers of just tunnels that just lead all throughout or they're interconnected and I mean they just take you all over Uh, this one did they find anything along those lines yeah so um this uh the way that Egyptians in general just build their tombs is um they want to discourage grave robbing as much as possible especially from the time period that this tomb is believed to date from they're not a hundred percent sure yet just because again these mummies we never even knew of these people existing before so we do believe though that this is a new kingdom um, tomb which is a little bit newer and so we see the tombs get a little bit more more complex um, a lot of secret tunnels and things like that a little bit more uh, well hidden um, or the doors are a little bit harder to get through and then once you get through the doors of the tomb you know there's a bunch of like um dead ends, I guess I would say, mm, and, right, or right, false right, right. doors, um, right, you know, so right. that you think you've taken all the treasure out of the tomb, but really <laughs> there's another antechamber somewhere and something like that. Just because tomb robbing was such a problem, this method of tomb building was made to confuse those robbers, hopefully thinking if they got a few pieces of gold, they might want to leave or not search any further or just get lost and give up. 
And speaking of gold, uh, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, there was th this mummy of a woman found with a solid gold mask. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're talking that that also had gaming pieces uh, from an ancient game that we even yeah. have here in house. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this was, and, and I think out of anything that really stuck out, I mean, well, it's actually two, the gold mask as well as uh, the metal axe in her hand, right? Yeah. Well, that was actually, so this um, one tomb, what we find happening um, as Egyptian tombs and things like that are raided and destroyed, we find some of the priests in antiquity trying to at least preserve the mummies of the deceased. And so that's why we find these large mummy caches um, nowadays. And so there were over a hundred mummies found in this one yeah, tomb. So one incredible. queen had the gold mask, one woman, um, and then another man who was a soldier. Right, buried, right. The soldier. That's right. Accent. That's right. Yeah. It was a soldier. That's right. My apologies. That's right. Okay. The soldier. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 it's, it's just absolutely incredible. Uh, and, and they had these coffins had individual faces or mm -hmm. they were each unique. The uh, detail and you could, is amazing. Right, right. Because you could, because you're able to figure out who was the male and who was the female. And they were decorated with scenes from the book of the dead. I mean, just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I mean, this is, and this was only a dig that took two years. Is that correct? Yeah. So they've been digging in Saqqara for um, quite some time now, um, just because it is a very archaeologically rich place. So they started digging here um, in 2020 during COVID uh, because archaeology doesn't stop for COVID. We're already wearing right, face course. masks when we dig, so you might as well keep going, right? <laughs> right, right, so, right. Um, so they... Uh, unearthed uh the book of the dead like i said earlier um in previous digs i can't remember if that was 2020 or 2021 most complete copy of the book of the dead ever found but they also have started unearthing all of these mummies one of which we now know to be um a queen of egypt uh queen um i think neith is what her sarcophagus has dubbed her mm -hmm. um and we have no idea where she exactly fits into <laughs> this Egyptian is why the, the 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 big massive shift in right. Egyptian history right well right, because right. we have no idea who she is she's not been mentioned anywhere else she's not been mentioned in any other tombs and all of a sudden we find not just her but it turns out it's it's probably her her tomb um so all these other mummies were just stashed in there and she kind of has her own um burial place they're calling it a pyramid but i'm not really sure from what i can tell from the pictures and the analysis um if the reporter is accurate in that if it's just a tomb or if it is an actual pyramid i'm not sure but um yeah it's it's amazing and then also too it turns out that a lot of the other people in this tomb are actually probably related to king tut a lot of his generals and officials that he would have worked with during his lifetime um as well as the um sarcophagus of Ramses the second's treasure those were all found on this site as well so like i said very archaeologically rich site and right, i right, am right. so excited to see all the things that we're going to be able to learn about egyptian history from this dig absolutely so so to our listeners if you're wondering okay i want to know a little bit more about this i want to just see some of the pictures look here's what you're going to do go on google of course and go to egyptologist zahi hawas that's z a h i hawas h a w a s s and there is a picture of him with this uh, mummy uh that took place of course at saqqara and it's just absolutely incredible like you would think it's a movie is is it just me chris here does it feel like yeah it's a movie scene in this I mean, picture it, it does look like a movie set absolutely <laughs> and um you can even see the toes of one of the mummies peeking out of their wrappings um and i would also maybe type the word clean um um neith in there right neith well. right right n-e-i-t-h-i right. -E um just because he actually is Dr. Hawass is actually also famous for um, discovering the mummy of Queen Hatshepsut. So, um, but that was in the early 2000s. So just typing queen mummy, Zai Hawass might not be the most helpful, but 
narrowing it down a little bit, you'll be able to see these pictures and right. um, some but of the, the beautiful. The key would be the excavation at Saquara. That would be the key yeah. to the research, right? Right. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I love it. Love it. Absolutely love it. Now, uh, moving into Christmas because this is our Christmas episode. So, Merry Christmas to the uh, to those that are listening, Christy. Merry Christmas. Yeah, to you. Merry Christmas, Carlos. Uh, thank you for my uh, my uh, happy Festivus. A uh, hoodie from <laughs> Seinfeld. I appreciate that. Now, uh, for those of you that are listening and may not know, we did a gift exchange here at the Biblical History Center, and uh, I got I got Christy, and Christy got me, and <laughs> uh, Christy got Lululemon, and I got a hoodie of uh, a Seinfeld episode that says "Happy Festivus." So, those of you that are also listening and you're familiar. Happy Festivus for the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> for the rest of us. So yeah. as and for talking- those also who don't know, it's <laughs> Lululemon is an amazing gift. I'm really appreciative. But Carlos wears a hoodie every single day. <laughs> oh goodness. And he and loves only Seinfeld. when it's cold. Only when it's cold. Only when yes, it's cold. only when it's cold. But and he also loves Seinfeld. So it's like right. the perfect pairing. Right, right. I'm, yeah. I'm the I'm the cool exec. I, I like to like to say that myself if I can add that, Christy. Yeah. <laughs> well, moving into Christmas, tell me, Christy, what what argument are you trying to start here as we <laughs> talk about calculating Christmas? Oh, this is so <laughs> this is fun. I'll let you take the lead. Go for so it. So I actually want to present two different theories about when Jesus was actually born. And then I'm gonna let our listeners decide which they prefer. Dot, dot, so dot. the one that we, we talk about in our tours a lot is um, since we know that um, Jesus was placed in a manger um, and then the shepherds were out in their fields watching their flocks by night, normally the um, the shepherds are in a sheepfold overnight. They're not going to be out in their fields. But twice a year, once after the wheat harvest and once after the barley harvest, which usually takes place between mid-March to late April, They're out for two weeks at a time, once after each harvest, to uh, just take part of the ancient agricultural process, to eat the little grains that have been left behind, to till the soil with the hooves of the sheep, and to also just leave fertilizer behind to uh, enrich the soil for next Mm. year's planting. Mm. Um, And so since the shepherds were out in their fields watching their flocks by night is what scripture tells us. I want to break um, out into the song now that you say that. We we talk about... (laughs) In our tours here, how we think Jesus might have been born around Passover, because um, that is when Passover is taking place in mid-March to Mm -hmm. mid-April, generally, because it's a lunar calendar. So, it's a little bit different than our solar calendar that we use now. Um, So, that's one theory about uh, about when Jesus was born. Um, I argue that it is in the spring. However... uh, Recently, <laughs> um, an article. Notice I'm just listening. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> However, in uh, a recent article from the Biblical Archaeology Review called Calculating Christmas actually makes a really interesting argument for Jesus actually having been born from anywhere from December 25th through right. January 6th. Right, right, so right. Um, the genesis of Christ. Right, right. Right. So the word that is used um, there is Genesis. Mm-hmm. Um, but does Genesis mean being born? the beginning of Christ being born or does right. Genesis mean his Referring conception? To the birth. Yeah. Right, right, right. So does that mean when Jesus was conceived? So some early um, church fathers and early Christians believed that Jesus was actually conceived at Passover, that the Holy spirit came upon Mary and Gabriel um, brought that message to her at Passover. Well, what's nine months from Passover Christmas. <laughs> so. Um, There was an early church father called Hippolytus, um, and he took this view, um, and uh, he dates to about 222 AD. Mm -hmm, Um, And mm -hmm. so uh, I know there's an argument going around, too, and it's an old and worn out argument (laughs) that the Christians chose December 25th to satiate the pagans because of Saturnalia and the celebration of soul. But actually, those festivals didn't begin until either the third century or later, which means Christianity had been around for 300 ish years. <laughs> Pause. 
<laughs> yeah. No, right, right, right. Yeah. Keep going. I'm sorry. Three, I just okay. wanted to insert that pause there. Yeah. 300 ish <laughs> years before, um, before these pagan holidays were being celebrated. So this is definitely not a pagan holiday that Christians have taken on. This date was chosen with intention. Um, and even today we see people celebrating Christmas at different times due to this um, difference. So uh, we see that the Eastern Orthodox Church, many of them celebrate Christmas actually on January 6th. Mm-hmm. I got to experience mm-hmm. that last time I was in Israel. Um, it was January and all the Christmas stuff was still up because the Eastern Orthodox Church was still celebrating Christmas. Um, whereas uh, a lot of um, Catholic traditions right, and right, Protestant right. traditions, that, right, right. you know, start on uh, on December 25th. But, um, you know, to me, both arguments are really intriguing. I still in, kind of lean towards the spring just because of what scripture says about the shepherds being out in the fields watching their flocks by night. That is a very unusual thing for them to be doing, which I think does indicate a special time of year. But um, but yeah, and, and there's another thing in that too. You know, uh, in the early church, um, the... The equinoxes were of significance as well as the solstices. And so Passover begins in the um, the vernal equinox generally, which is in the middle of spring. Um, and so that's a date of significance. And so um, they, they often think that holy things are associated with these equinoxes and these right. solstices. And so right. um, it would make sense that those in the early church think that Jesus is conceived on the vernal equinox and then is born on the winter solstice. So, so if, if there's, if there's anything I would say or encourage anyone and and Christy, feel free to step in, but if anything, whether you choose to go down the March route or December route or April route, the reality is that a savior was born Mm -hmm. and a savior came to us, whether it was in December in March or in April, the beautiful part about all of this is that a savior came to us. Is that fair to say at least? Absolutely. And what I love (laughs) about celebrating in Chris at in December, even though he might've been born in March or April is this is our darkest time, you know, and in our darkness, Mm -hmm. the light of the world came. You know, couldn't have said it better myself. Right. I love that imagery of the light of the world coming down in the midst of our darkest hour um, when we needed him most. So it's fair to also say that the mystery remains, right? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. So most people in antiquity didn't really celebrate their birthdays that much. So I don't think we'll ever know with 100% certainty. Um, But it is still so important to celebrate. Um, and be thankful for the coming of Christ. Right. Oh, come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thy nine advent. Here disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. Oh, I, 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 uh, I, I can appreciate this article for sure, Christy, and I appreciate your input. And I love how you wanted to, to start this off uh, or actually end the podcast. Uh, so thank you for that. I think it was great. Uh, so if, if there is anything I'd like to, and, and even you, Christy, if anything, uh, we'd like to remind everyone uh, about our upcoming events. Uh, we do want to say that uh, for the Christmas season, uh, we will be closed as the Biblical History Center. We're closed for the season on December the 24th, all the way through the 6th of January. So also squeezing in there a Happy New Year. Yeah. Uh, and we <laughs> <laughs> also squeezing that in as well as uh, just those of you that are listening and it's before the 24th, we've got our major tours happening now. And then we've got a very special event happening on December the 23rd uh, of Two specific offerings at four thirty and at five thirty on that day. Are we full on that, Christy? I believe. Oh we're yeah, full, we are. Right? We are more than full. I can't even <laughs> squeeze one more person in. We are you can't. There's out. no more room in the inn. There's are no you more room me? in the inn. <laughs> well, it's a starry <laughs> night event, and it's going to be exciting. We're going to have animals. We're going to have live music. Uh, just a great time to look back. And be grateful that a Savior came to us and a Savior was born. Uh, and that's that's going to be the beautiful part about it. So fast-forwarding uh, a little bit here. Uh, in February, we've got a lecture. Uh, I believe it's the Archaeology of Easter. Is that correct, Christy? 
Yep. Archaeology of Easter is on February 24th, I believe. And that is with um, archaeologist um, Dr. Um, Oh, my goodness. Wow. I just put his name on social media. You did. Uh, Dr. Thomas Davies from Lipscomb (laughs) University. Sorry, Dr. Davies. Um, my mind was wanting to switch the names in Davis Thomas. And I was like, no, that's Oh, not. no, no, that um, yeah, Dave Thomas would be, be a different guy, wouldn't it? Yeah, different guy. So that he's <laughs> going to be speaking on the archaeology of Easter. I'm really right. looking forward to this lecture. Yeah. Um, and it will pair perfectly with our manger tours, um, or not our manger tours, our empty tomb tours that yeah. start February 7th this year. Easter is early, and we always start these tours two months out from Easter. So right. Easter this year is April 9th. Um, and so we start our empty tomb tours on February 7th, and they will continue through April 8th. Now, let me also add now, before we get to the empty tomb tours, uh, we have got in the month of January, with a little bit of February, our Journey to Galilee tour. Uh, the Journey of Galilee tour uh, gives us the ability to give you a 10% discount uh, celebrating the new year. So if you're checking out online, make sure you use the discount code WINNER10. It'll be for a limited time only, but also in January and a little bit of February uh, for the Journey of Gal- Journey to Galilee tour, we're featuring featuring ancient Bedouin beverages. Uh, so you want to come on out and you want to not only experience a tour, but also experience our ancient Bedouin beverages. Uh, so that's that's looking ahead. That's looking at the schedule, of course. Uh, those of you that are listening, of course, we thank you always for tuning in. We thank you uh, that not only do you listen to this podcast, but you support the mission of the Biblical History Center. And if you haven't been back, come on back. If you were just here, thank you so much much and we look forward to you coming back we try to offer uh, a variety of new things uh, even new specific exhibits that we're working on Uh, there's some new programming up ahead as far as steam days are concerned so we're closing out the year with a bang and if i'm not mistaken it looks like it's going to be a record breaking year as well is that correct christy oh yeah so there's a lot of things that we're celebrating there's a lot of things that are happening uh, but we can't do any of this if it wasn't for you so thank you to our donors thank Thank you for our supporters. Thank you to our visitors, our guests, uh, all of our patrons. So uh, from Carlos and Christy, we want to wish you again a Merry Christmas, and we hope you're enjoying our Biblical History Center podcast.